Amen. Hey, I got a lot of writing up on the board, but we're in the topic of the intro to apologetics, which means... I'm not sorry for being a Christian. Well, I'm glad you're not sorry for being a Christian, Bobby. That's close, but actually it means to give a defense of for the hope that lies within us, okay? And we've been seeing the very first thing that people seem to be uh, given a defense uh, against is the bare bones uh, belief that there is even a God. Does God exist? We saw there, and we're still in chapter one, hopefully finish it up tonight. And as we saw there, there's four classical arguments. There's actually a whole bunch more, but four classical ones for the existence of God. As we saw before was the ontological argument or the argument of being, the cosmological argument or the argument of beginnings, the teleological argument, argument of design, or the anthropological argument or the argument of morals, okay, is what we've been seeing so far. Do you guys remember the acronym, the trusty acronym? If somebody says, how do you know that God even exists? What's the acronym that goes to your brain so you can remember the four classical arguments for the existence of God? Oh, cow. Well, at least you got the first two. Praise God. It beats none. Uh, overjoyed cows are tasty. You know what I'm saying? Or old chickens are terrible. Now, see, that works both ways. So either whatever meat product you want to choose, it's very nifty, Ron. You can remember it just like that, and you can get the four classical arguments for the existence of God. We've seen on, on the second page there the reason for everything uh, that has a beginning. We've been focusing, uh, next chapter is going to be more into this argument, the teleological argument or the argument of design. What we've been focusing on, though, is this guy mainly, the cosmological argument or the argument of beginnings. And that's a scientific law, not a scientific opinion, that's a scientific law called the law of cause and effect that every material effect must have an adequate cause that existed before that effect. In other words, you didn't just pop out of thin air. Where did we come from? Who caused us? Mom and Dad. That's right, Mom and Dad. I saw that coming out there. Uh, and, of course, some Mom and Dad caused somebody, and on and on it goes back. Uh, to the beginning, okay? And what we find is uh, on the page, there's some examples. Water doesn't just appear out of nowhere. It was caused. It came from somewhere. Uh, a window doesn't break by itself. It was caused to be broken. When we get sick, we look for a cause. It was chicken something, chicken casserole, chicken sticks, chicken whatever. I don't know what you're eating. But obviously it caused. Something caused that, okay? And the point was we thought logically, not just biblically, because again, isn't that the accusation against us as Christians? That somehow we are intellectually inept. Like the rest of the world, the scientific community. But logically, is anything in this world existing without a cause? No. So therefore, how could you say logically that the whole universe exists without a cause? It's crazy. And then we saw at the top of the next page that if you were walking on an island and your initial assumption was, I am the only one here, nobody's ever been here before, and you came across, you saw that picture there of a perfectly formed cabin with all the amenities, uh, what's the logical response? You say, well, hey, it's a perfect place to live. It's perfectly suited with my knees. It even has running water, plumbing, and electricity. This is awesome. Cable, I can still catch the football programs. This is amazing. It purely happened by chance. It, would that be logical to say that? Absolutely not. It's crazy. What's the logical response? Obviously, my assumption was wrong. I'm not the only one here. Somebody was here before me. Somebody caused that cabin to be. So once again, when you see all that design, that's what the whole next chapter is all about. Okay, when you see that design in something, how in the world could you say that it's logical to say it came from nowhere? Okay, it's crazy. Okay, and the universe has a cause. Now, they try to explain it away in a couple different ways. Okay, seemingly logically. And that's the key word, seemingly. But it's not when you start to, wait a second, let's take a look at that again. Okay, and the first one we saw last time, we made it through, is they, they want to say three things about the universe. Okay, and the first one they say, well, uh, uh, there, there's no need for God because the universe is eternal. No. And this is what we saw last time. That was the big discovery with uh, Albert Einstein. It wasn't just E equal MC squared and, and, you know, work on your hair or something. Uh, it was the issue that he proved that there was a beginning point in creation. Now, why is that important? Because there's the law of cause and effect. If there's a beginning to creation, the universe, it implies a beginner. So that was his big breakthrough is, listen, he proved the existence of God. Okay, And just because you put a label on that event, a beginning to the universe, the Big Bang, what does that prove? That doesn't disprove God. And just because you put a label on it, so what? Okay, they didn't change nothing, and it didn't explain the logical question, who caused that beginning? 
Okay, and then we saw there's some uh, 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 evidence, not just biblical, logical evidence. There's scientific evidence why we know the universe is not eternal. The universe is expanding, which means it did have a beginning point and it's moving away from that point, which implies once again, not just with Einstein's theories, but basic science knows now there was in fact a beginning. So there had to be a beginner. It's not always eternal. If it was eternal, there wouldn't be a beginning. So we know that scientifically. The second law of thermodynamics we saw was the next one. And basically, uh, the universe is running down. It's running out of gas. Okay, was the analogy that we saw there. Well, wait a second. If you're eternal, how can you run out of gas? By nature of being eternal, you shouldn't have any gas problems. Okay, you should always keep moving. You should always have a full tank. But that's not what we see. And then finally, radiation echo is where we kind of left off there. And what we saw that, listen, everywhere... Every rock puts forth radiation echo, which proves that there's low level radiation from some past catastrophe or explosion. Okay, giving us proof that everything, as even the scripture would say, even the rocks cry out. Okay, uh, of God's existence and his creation. That's exactly what we see. Science. Now, the top of the next page there, page five, it says, now imagine this following scenario. You hear a small explosion in your home. And no, I wasn't trying to help fix something. I wasn't there that day. Uh, you, you concerned, so you, you, you shout to your child, what was that? And the child yells back, nothing, it just happened. Right? And so we just go back to doing whatever we do. Mm, no. Okay, you got two options. First one, would you say to yourself, hmm, that's strange. Oh, well, if my child says it just happened, then I guess I'll accept that and assume that the small explosion did not have a cause. And then even if you go into the room... And prior to that, earlier that day, the room was clean, but you go up there just a couple hours later, it's after the explosion, you see a giant mess all over the place in the room that wasn't there before. Your child, you look at him and says, what happened? If you say, hey, you know what? I'm going to slap a label on the contents of my room. It's called the big mess. So I don't have to explain anymore that it came from... (laughs) <laughs> do you understand just because they slapped the label big bang so first of all the big bang proves that god exists because there's a beginning and second of all just because you slapped the label on it you didn't answer my question who caused it just because you said your room is a big mess you didn't answer my question who caused the mess and that's the second logical response right parents what do you do you know you run upstairs and you look for and punish what the cause okay that's logic okay is what he says there there is abundant scientific underlying that scientific evidence not just biblical scientific evidence that the universe came into being in a sudden explosive cataclysmic way yet when you ask some very intelligent people what was that they claim nothing it just happened (laughs) what excuse me i don't care how many degrees you have now, that was the opening text that we saw last week. Again, if you were here, uh, we saw there in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, it, the Bible tells us why these people would do this. Why would these people, and I, I'm sure that a lot of them have much higher IQs than you and I, but how could you come back and say, uh, nothing, the universe just happened? How could you say that with your intelligence? Because the Bible tells us they don't want there to be a God. They are willingly ignorant. They're dumb on purpose. They don't want there to be a God. So I choose to believe something absolutely ignorant. And dare I say, illogical and unscientific. Okay? That's why, uh, as we saw there. And one big thing, just a little detour here, if I get some room on here, is what they say, we say, well, um, um, I, I don't see any evidence for it now, but we all know that it all happened by chance. You know how ridiculous that is? He thought just labeling it the Big Bang and somehow that just makes it all go away and it doesn't. This, this is the same thing. Well, you know, it just all happened by chance. Okay, what is, have you ever thought of that? What is chance? Chance is an adjective to describe a mathematical probability. Chance has no creative power. Chance can't create nothing. Chance is nothing. It's a word. What can chance do? So so again, you're just throwing out a word and somehow it makes it all go away. (laughs) It's crazy. You can say chance all you want. Okay, in fact, we'll get into this Lord one later. They've proven that mathematically, that any event, any event, okay, that is greater than, I think, uh, 1 to the the, the 10th to the 50th power, I think, is, is the limiting factor. 
They know beyond a shadow of a doubt, even scientifically, that it's impossible to happen. Uh, let, let me give you something uh, uh, to, to describe that. One to the 50th power, if you will. Would be like me saying, okay, I am going to take a baseball and I'm going to throw it so hard that it's going to land on the moon. And then if I were to actually calculate the math of the chances of me ever doing that, I don't care how many millions and billions of tries I get, okay, is it ever going to happen? Right? And that's what it means when it gets to the 50th power. It's just like, it's like trying to throw a baseball to the moon. It'll never happen. I don't care how many years you go back. I don't care how many attempts. It just will never happen. Folks, when you look at, we'll get into this later, but when you look at the formation of just the so-called simple cell, which there is no, so, there is no simple cell, that's a lie, okay? You're talking into the trillions, not 50. It's impossible for anything to just appear on the scene to evolve a cell. And oh, by the way, that's just one cell. We, our bodies have 50 trillion, possibly much more than that, 50, 100 trillion, there's people, whatever, but 50 trillion different cells. And they all have to be there all at the same time or you're dead meat. It's impossible. It's like trying to say that uh, uh, I can throw a baseball to the moon. But, you know, I, I calculated the chance. I don't care if you calculated it. It tells us it can't happen. Right? It's another kind of side thing I just want to explain. Now, so it says there, if there's obviously a cause for a little bang, like in the room, right? Came from somewhere. Call it a big mess all you want. You didn't answer my question. Where did the little bang come from? Came from the kid. Doesn't it also make sense that there would be a cause for a big bang? Right? It's pure logic. Okay? Move on to the next one. They say, well, okay, you got me on that one. Uh, the universe is not eternal. Okay? <laughs> okay? And so this next one, this is actually what they're starting to print in uh, textbooks, folks. Is they say that, no, the universe created itself. Yep. Because we see that evidence all the time. How many guys created yourself? None of us. I, I know. Let's calculate the chances of that happening. It will never happen. Right? I don't care. It's just so uh, you can calculate all you want. It, it ain't going to happen. You can say, well, if I had to just, if, I, I know, millions of billions of years and give enough chance, it, no, it'll never happen. Okay? That's pure logic. Okay? They say it created itself. Okay? This would mean that in the beginning of time, something is your blank there. Uh, the universe created itself, your first blank. Uh, this would mean that in the beginning of time, something, listen, came from nothing. Okay? But again, logic says, if ever there was a time when there was truly nothing, what would we have today? Nothing. nothing. So how could you even say logically that something, and in fact, then you're going to say the whole universe came from nothing. Now, why would they make that ridiculous statement and actually print it in textbooks? To eliminate God and to eliminate what we've caught them on. Okay, we're cleaning up their logical mess. And they just scoot it on to a different thing. It doesn't explain it still, but they keep printing it. Okay, and you repeat a lie loud enough, long enough, off enough, people believe it. Okay, I guess that's what it is. Okay, is, is what they say is they caught this because there's a beginning. It's not eternal. And so they say that it all started with a little tiny ball of dirt as we saw before. Okay, and every... Thinking Christian, even logical people, doesn't have to be a Christian, asks them and has been asking them the logical question, okay, that's a neat theory, but mm, where did the dirt come from? Who made the dirt? Because remember we talked before, the dirt used to be really big, thousands of miles across, and it came down onto this little, little teeny dot and blew up. Where'd it come from? Because, and they don't have an answer. They call it the X factor. Okay, some do. You know what that is? That's another label, like chance or Big Bang. It's basically the fancy, smancy, scientific way of saying we have no stinking idea. You didn't answer my question. Where did the dirt come from? So they got caught with that, because that's illogical, because the law of cause and effect. They're actually undermining science. The dirt had to come from somewhere. Okay? So they created, they said, well, okay, fine, fine, you got us on that one. So it just, um, it came, it, everything came from nothing. Boom. I'm not kidding you. It's being printed in textbooks today. Can you believe that? No wonder Peter said, in the last days, scoffers will come. And I think in the last days, God's also providing the equipment, the ability, the science, uh, the technology to understand his existence like never before in the history of mankind. And yet the audacity of mankind to continue to reject it. We're in the last days. Okay, it goes on and says this. Since something can't just come out of nothing, 
This option does not logically make sense. Nor is there any, underline this, any scientific evidence that this has ever happened or could even possibly happen. Again, to play on the, the other analogy that we saw before, with the checkbook. Your checkbook, you spin it all. There's nothing in there. So, what are the chances? I know. I will open it, close it, and I will do it over a million years. And surely something will, it will create money out of thin air. That would, yeah, sure, yeah. That's awesome. I love watching the Nature Channel. Yeah, that's what they say, isn't it? <laughs> what? No, I don't care. You can say chance all you want. You can say a million. You can say a trillion years. It has to come from somewhere. Okay, it doesn't come from something. Or right, here's one. Uh, ladies, wouldn't it be awesome if uh, this is how babies arrived on the scene? They came from nowhere. You're just walking along the road and all of a sudden, boom, there's a baby. I'm going to take it home. Yeah. Now, man, we don't usually get that because they're the ones going through the pain of childbirth. But ladies get all excited about that analogy. If that was possible, wouldn't it be great? You're just walking along and boom, there they are. Right? No. The baby had to come from somewhere. Babies don't pop out of thin air. But they say the whole universe popped out of thin air. I don't, what? It's crazy. Okay? Let's continue on. Uh, Robbie Zacharias, I love this, uh, what he said. He said, some years ago, I was having dinner with a few scholars, most of whom were scientists. They were a fine group of people, and I was honored to be in their company. At one point, our discussion veered into the conflict between naturalism starting point, nature, nature alone, i.e. evolution without God, and supernaturalism starting point, uh, which is that God is the only su- sufficient explanation for our origin. I asked him a couple questions. He said, guys, if the Big Bang were indeed where it all happened, may I ask what preceded the Big Bang? Now, why is this statement completely logical at that point? Because if there's a beginning... Has to be a beginner, okay? Their answer, which he said I anticipated, was that the universe was shrunk down to a singularity. That's this guy. Okay? He said, but uh, but wait a second. Isn't it correct that a singularity is defined by science as a point at which all the laws of physics break down? And meaning science that as we know it isn't in effect? And they said, that is correct. Uh, He said, then technically your starting point is not scientific either. Right? Think about it. Pure logic. Didn't have to quote the Bible, nothing. Not that that's bad. But pure logic, he exposed it. He says their silence was, and their expressions, betrayed their scurrying mental searches for an escape hatch. Can I translate that for you? We got caught being willingly ignorant, and we can't come up on the spot with another ignorant answer. To elude the reality that there is a God. Okay, that's our society today. I want to back up the train before we flip the page. We talked about the last time this uh, eternal, and I mentioned a phrase that I said, and if you recall, because I know you guys remembered last week and you gotta, you've been quoting it all week, right? Yeah, whatever, I dream. So anyway, so I said that uh, we're not eternal, but we've been given an eternal nature. Now on the outset, that kind of seems contradictory, Right? So I wanted to kind of visualize it and explain it to you what we mean by that uh, scripturally, uh, even logically and scientifically. Okay, God, as we saw before, and this is why I wanted to leave this up here before uh, for tonight, is God, by definition, is self-existent. He has no beginning. He lives in the realm of eternity where there is no time. Remember that? And that's represented by the arrows forever in either direction. There is no beginning point with God. Okay? Now, how in the world can we be given an eternal nature? Because we're creating in the image of God. Morally and spiritually, and because we're created in God's spirit, which is eternal from him, that's why we as human beings will continue on. One of two places, forever in heaven or forever in hell. Okay? So how could that be? Well, it's because if you look at this visual, and this is what I want to give you tonight on this aspect, is God has no beginning, arrows on either side. You and I did have a beginning, but since we were created in the image of God, we have an arrow going this way. Got it? It doesn't make us eternal like God is, meaning self-existent, i.e. God. I'll get to that in a second. It just means that we had a beginning point and we have a forever point, uh, which means either uh, heaven or hell. Now, the reason why that's important is because new age will come along and they will take portions of the scripture and say, we are God. And we just need to acknowledge it. And what they'll do is they'll pull out scriptures uh, that say like this. Well, didn't you read what Jesus said? He says, the kingdom of God is within you. And therefore you are God. You are little Christs. 
No. Let's look at that, not even just, not biblically, let's look at that at pure logic. God, by definition, is all-powerful, all-knowing, everywhere present, and self-existent. He has no beginning. So how could you say, logically, that a creature, mankind, any person who had a beginning, granted you'll continue to exist forever, but you had a beginning, be a being who doesn't have a beginning. I don't even have to quote one verse to the contrary, to show that is illogical to say that something that had a beginning, a person could ever become that by nature, which is self-existent. Oh, and by the way, is all powerful. How many guys know several people off the top of your head who are still alive today because you aren't all powerful and can't send lightning bolts across the planet and <laughs> take them out, right? Like guns and stuff like that, <laughs> right? And uh, we're not all powerful, okay? How many guys know everything? Praise God, nobody raised their hand. That's awesome. Except for Nikki. Let's pray for him later. That's to be on the... Uh, take notes, Bobby. Joe, to you too. Okay, in case Bobby forgets. Uh, you know, because he's not all knowing. <laughs> you know, so... But anyway, so... What? You don't know everything. I like what one guy, he was debating this... Uh, 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 was giving a talk at a school. And the kid says... He said, uh, he said I don't believe in God. He said, really? And he, he says, I am my own God. I said, okay, that's interesting. So you're God. Remember, God is all-powerful, all-knowing, everywhere present. So he just picked on this all-knowing one. He says, okay, that's interesting. Uh, he says, uh, you're, so you're God and you make up your own rules, right? Because that's what society wants to do. They make up their own rules. He says, so you're God and you make up your own rules. Um, let's see, do you know everything? Everything that's ever known in the whole universe, whatever? He says, well, no, of course not. And he says, well, I'll just give you the benefit of the doubt. You seem like a sharp guy. Uh, maybe you know half of everything. Half of it, and the guys, yeah, oh, oh, oh. yeah. He said, okay, so you know half of everything. Uh, could it be that God exists in the other half? Who thought? It goes in his brain, right? We are not God, we can't be God. Okay, we're eternal in nature, meaning we'll forever continue to exist this way, but we're not eternal as a self existent God. We can't be God, we'll never be God. It's impossible, illogical, and of course, unbiblical. Now, uh, New Agers aren't the only ones who say that. Environmentalism says that. It's called pantheism, pan all, theism, theos, God, all is God. The earth is God, everything's God. Excuse me? We're not God, the earth is not God. It's ridiculous. Again, what I stress as I rip through these people who actually promote this, it's not just not biblical, it's illogical. Okay? You have to understand that. Hinduism says that all is God. Mormons say that you can become a God. Well, wait a second. How can I become a God? I, I don't even have to quote one verse. Mormon guy, have you ever had a birthday? You ever celebrate that critter? You're celebrating your beginning. God, by definition, has no beginning. So how can anyone become a God who is all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present, self-existent? It's illogical, not just unbiblical. Uh, okay, uh, spirit guides, uh, 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 messages from so-called angels. Uh, Wiccans, believe it or not, teach that, that the divinity is within. And where did all this start? Same lie, Genesis chapter 3. Satan said, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. Same goofball lie that people are promoting today, that somehow you either are God and you need to acknowledge it, illogical, not just unbiblical, or that you can become a God. Illogical, not just unbiblical. Make sense? And then, of course, just real quick, uh, Isaiah 43, 44, and 45, read those chapters. Repeatedly, God says, oh, by the way, in case you don't use the logic I gave you and follow the laws of science, okay, uh, there is no other God. Uh, Isaiah 43, 10, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, before me no God was formed. Why did he say before me? Because there is no before him. By definition of being supreme being, he has no beginning. So there is no before him. Before me, he says, no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. Why? Because he kills forever in both directions. Isaiah 44, 6, 8. This is what the Lord says. I am the first. I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. Is there any God besides me? No, there is no other rock. I know not one. Isaiah 45, 5. Why? Uh, I am the Lord. There is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. Certainly, we need to share the scripture to give a defense for the hope that lies within us. I'm sorry. We cannot become God. You can realize and think you're God all you want, but it's not just unbiblical. It's illogical. You had a beginning, so you cannot be God. 
Okay, a little side detour there. Flip the page. Let's continue on. Robert Jastrow, the founder, uh, director of NASA's Goddard Institute of Space Studies, he says this. This is a great quote. He says, a sound explanation may exist for the explosive birth of our universe. God, that's right, Joe, God. Okay, but if it does, a scientist's pursuit of the past ends in the moment of creation. The scientist's quest for answers for the origin of the universe ends like a bad dream. In it, he has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He's about to conquer the highest peak. And as he pulls himself over the final rock, he's greeted by a band of theologians who've been sitting there for centuries. Can I translate that for you? That's what we talked about a couple of discussions ago. How much money are we stinking wasting and we're paying for? It, it, just read the Bible. There's a lot just on that first page. How much money could we save if you just read the first page? We pay off that national debt just like that. Absolute lie. Now, so this gives us, listen, to the third uh, uh, rational response, and that is the universe has a creator. That's the real one. That's the one that they're going through all this willingly ignorance about, uh, is the universe has a creator. Is your blank. Now, again, I stress this, guys. It's not just biblical, because that's what they'll look at us like, well, if you brainwash goober... You just, that's all, of course you Christians just say, you know, the, the, it came from God and quote a verse like here. But listen, it's not just biblical, it's what? Logical. It's scientific even. It's backed by science. Do you get it? We're given a defense for the hope that lies within us. It's not just biblical, as if that's bad, but that's the way that the world uh, thinks when we start quoting verses, isn't it? And so we can demonstrate it is intellectually responsible uh, philosophically uh, uh, reliable and satisfying and it's also logical and scientific. Here's what he says. The first sentence in the Bible says, in the beginning time, God created the heavens, space, and the earth. Okay, Genesis 1, 1. Okay, and again, might I add, not be- after what we just saw and the science and the scientific laws and the logic, which one, and there's a whole lot more evidence and proof and science, which one takes more faith to believe in and maintain based on the evidence that there is no God or that there is a God? It actually takes more faith to maintain this goofy idea that uh, it's eternal and that it just popped out of nowhere from nothing. And yet, isn't that what we're told? You can't have faith in schools when your belief takes more faith than mine. Isn't that insane? Okay, he says this. In arguing for the existence of God, your next blank there, okay, the existence of God, 13th century Christian philosopher Thomas Aquinas uh, always presupposed Aristotle's view that the universe is eternal. Okay, now he did this for a reason. On the basis of that difficult assumption, he then sought to prove that God exists. So why did he do that? Why did he gravitate towards that? Well, listen, because Aquinas said, well, wait a second. If he were to start with the premise that the universe had a beginning, which Einstein proved, okay, and we all know now, he said, well, then his task would be, underline this, too easy. <laughs> Can I tell you something? It is that easy. All right? You know, I said commercial with the, this, was it stables or something? You hit the easy button, <laughs> that was easy. Right? Oh, if I only knew where life came from, <laughs> read first page of the Bible, that was easy. Right? But it can't be that easy. I mean, surely it's got to be complicated and, 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 and you've got to use this giant scientific jargon to confuse people and make you sound really interesting and, and the rest of us dum-dums because we can't speak like you. And, and blah, blah, blah. You just hide behind the words. It really is that easy. God did it. Okay? But see, that's, he actually took the wrong approach because he thought, are you serious? Is it really? Yeah, it is that easy. Obviously, if there's a beginning, something had to bring the universe into existence, but now modern astrophysicists and astronomy had dropped into the lap of the Christians precisely that premise, according to Aquinas, which makes God's existence virtually undeniable, given that whatever begins to exist has a cause, and that the universe began to exist, there must be some sort of transcendent cause for the origin of of the universe. It really is that easy. Not just because the Bible says so, but because the scientific data and pure common sense logic says so. 
Okay, and you, it, it really is that easy. God didn't make it hard for us. I always had an instructor in seminary, Dr. Couch. He said, listen, God doesn't speak with forked tongue. And did you know that when he uh, authored the scripture, Inspiration of the Holy Spirit, okay, working through the men, uh, as they uh, pinned down the words, God did it so that we could not only read it, but he did it in such a way that we can understand it. He wants us to understand the Bible. He didn't write in some secret code that only the elite could ever understand. He didn't. Write, he wants us to know it. And yet we approach it, and so I'll just know it. What? And, then, and, and, and it's really that simple. Where did the universe come from? Oh, God did it. We are the ones who make it difficult. Okay? Let's continue on. If everything, is your next blank there, if everything... In our world came from something. Why should we believe that the universe came from nothing? Think about that. If everything in our world came from something, then why should we believe that the universe came from nothing? Now, did this expo low order low odor? Try saying that five times real fast. Uh, dry erase chisel edged black ink pen. Come from nowhere. Please say no. That's right, Mary. No, thank you. You got involved. Right? This is a tiny little just pen. Right? It's not even animate. But it's something. It would be illogical to say that this came from nowhere. How many guys have noticed that the universe is kind of large? And full of large stuff. So we would laugh at somebody who says this came from nowhere. But somehow it's scientific to say, hey... Everything, the whole universe came from nowhere too. you got to be kidding me. It's that easy. Push the button. Turn the first page of the Bible. God did, okay? It came from somewhere. And that's what the Bible says. Every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of what? Everything. Hebrews 3, 4. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed purely by chance. Because chance, as we all know, is a creative power. And it makes things happen. No, it's not. It's an adjective to describe a mathematical probability. Okay, it came and was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Now, if you're thinking about this, this actually leads to a logical question. And I used to ask this as a non-Christian down there at the bottom. Well, wait a second. If everything scientifically has a cause, then what caused God? You ever have somebody ask you that? Oh, yeah. Well, who made God? Okay, actually it's an illogical thing, but let's, let's get into that. Okay, at the top of the next page, with that guy in that nifty look there. Uh, this is a good question because the answers tell us a lot about God. Consider the following descriptions about God in the Bible. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. Right? John chapter 4. Right? And which means that you don't necessarily see God. Right? Spirit. And Jesus gives the analogy like the wind. The spirit is like the wind, right? You guys don't see wind, right? You see, the effects of wind can stir up dust, blow the leaves around, but you don't technically see wind. And we saw before, well, then people say, well, if I can't see it, you know, if I can't see God, he, can't, he doesn't exist. Really? As we saw before, you don't see the television waves, you don't see the radio waves. Do you see the heat that's being put? No. So therefore, TV, radio, and heat does not exist. That's ridiculous. So just because you can't see something doesn't mean, logically, that it doesn't exist. God is spirit. And those who worship in spirit and truth. So that's one aspect of his nature. Okay, and that's why Paul says in Romans chapter 1, God's invisible qualities are made known by what he has made. The intelligent design, again, that's all the next chapter. Uh, here's another one, Jeremiah 23. Am I only a God nearby, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Can anyone hide in a secret place that I can't see him? And the answer would be, no, no that's right. Isn't that wild? I'll never forget, one of my favorite analogies of God, and what he's talking about is God is everywhere present. Let me finish this statement there. Do not I feel heaven and earth, declares the Lord. We forget that. If we really acknowledge the omnipresence of God, right? He's everywhere present. It's a basic attribute of a supreme being, God. And if we really thought about that and kept that in our brain all day long, how would that change our behavior? Mm-hmm. He sees everything. He hears everything. He watches everything. And praise God, Christian, he still loves us. Amen? Myself included. I like what one guy said real quick. He, his analogy, he was a true story. He was a doctor 
And uh, he was just a, a alcoholic, and the routine after just a stressful day, every night, late night, they'd, him and his buddies would go across the street from the hospital, and they'd always go get tanked in the bar and whatever. And uh, so one, he just, the emptiness of life and the materialism, and it's, it's just whatever. And he finally broke down one night when he got back home, and he dropped on his knees, true story, and he became a Christian. Cried out to God, asked him to save his soul. And uh, to Jesus. And, and so he goes back into work the next day. And uh, his heart had totally changed. And so the guys, you know, it's time for the nightly routine, right? Late night, let's go, you know, we're all stressed out. Let's go get tanked again across the street bar. He says, no. And uh, they were like, well, what's gotten in with you, you know? And so they began to tease him. This went on for a couple of weeks. And they're finally like, listen, are you, what happened? You know, and so he confessed. He says, listen, I became a Christian. He says, come on, man. You just take a drink. What's the big deal? Let's just go over there. And they, they would say, they say, well, well what, what's the big deal? They say, it's, come on, it's just one time. He says, no, I don't want to do it. He says, well, why? He says, and and they, they put him to the test. He says, wait, wait a second, you mean to tell me that if you are all alone and you're all by yourself and you're really stressed out and you had a bottle of whiskey in your house that you wouldn't just take a drink all by yourself uh, uh, and nobody would ever see it and just take one big old drink just for old time's sake? He says, no. He said, that's where you got it all wrong. You see, since I became a Christian, I'm never alone. I see, we forget that, don't we? God is omnipresent. He sees everything. Let's continue on. Uh, so that's another attribute, okay? But you remain the same. Your years will never end, right? Immutable is the term that's used there. God doesn't change, okay? He doesn't run out of energy, okay? Uh, that's an important thing that some people want to attack the character of God in the creation account when it says, and God rested. Because, man, he was tired. He was sweating bullets. Woo-hoo, he needed a nap. No, it means he ceased from what he was doing. It's not tired like, I'm running out of energy. God doesn't run out of energy. Okay, if, if he ran out of energy, again, that would attack the nature of what and who his supreme being is. He wouldn't be all powerful if he was running out of gas. Right? So that's just kind of a little side note. So we see that he is spirit. He's invisible at this particular time. Uh, he's omnipresent. Uh, who, who is able to build a temple for him? God, since the heavens, even the highest heavens, can't contain him. That's how Huey G is. Even though he walks with this enemy. Absolutely cool thing. But you remain the same. Your years will never end. He's immutable. But don't forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. Well, there you go. Those days in the Genesis account don't mean literal 24 hours days. It says right here, uh, with the Lord, a thousand years years that was just like a day and so really what that means is there was day one and then millions of years later day two came and the millions no it doesn't the hebrew word there yom means 24 hours do your homework any hebrew scholar knows that and by the way you're taking this out of context this passage quoted here in second peter has nothing to do with the creation account so you can't superimpose that on the creation account two totally different contexts and three it's what all he's talking about is god in the realm of eternity where he's above and beyond time, as we saw last time, he can look at the realm of time any time he wants. A thousand years, a day, a day, a thousand. He sees the whole thing. That's all it is. Time is irrespective of God. Right? That's all he's talking about there. But that is who God is. He says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord who, listen to this, who is present, who was past, and who is to come future, the Almighty. And that's what he's talking about. He is above and beyond of that. Beginning, the end, the alpha, the omega, past, present, future. All wrapped in one. Why? Because he's above and beyond it all. Sees it all at the same time. Because time is a created thing along with space and matter. So that's God. So now let's go to the answer. Okay, if everything has a cause, then what caused God? Or who made God? Well, these verses tell us that God is eternal. In your first blank there. God is eternal. He's unchanging and powerful. God is everywhere. At the same time, okay, he is spirit, he is timeless, he is always near, he has no beginning and no end, he is uncaused. I'll break that down again. These verses tell us God is eternal, he's unchanging and powerful, he is everywhere at the same time, he is spirit, he is timeless, he's always near, he has no beginning and no end He is uncaused. Now, here's the whole point in talking about the character of God. And this is also why I wanted to leave this section up tonight. Because when you pay attention to the basic attributes of a supreme being, by definition, even secular philosophy, you don't even want to believe that there's a God. But if you want to flirt with the idea that there is a God, a supreme being, 
You have to acknowledge that he has to have these characteristics, okay? He is uncaused. Only things that had a beginning, listen, like our universe, need a beginner. God had no beginning, so God did not need to be made. It goes against, this question is actually illogical and it's moot because it goes against this aspect of a supreme being who has no beginning. You're asking a time-based question, beginning, who made, upon a being who by definition cannot be made because they never had a beginning. Self-existent. You got it? On the outside, it seems logical. Well, then who made God? Well, God cannot be made, otherwise he's not God. He has to be unmade, meaning he's self-existent. And you're using your little time-based brain to ask a time-based question on a being who's above and beyond time. It's actually illogical to ask that question. Okay, so you can only give an answer, but you can demonstrate how illogical it is. Now, let's close on this big one. It's actually, I want to close on this cartoon at the bottom, BC Comics. Okay, and deal with this aspect, because unfortunately, these critters seem to come in when it comes to the origins. Now that you're looking at all this stuff, and well, the universe is not eternal. Uh, it certainly didn't create itself. Well, it had to come from somewhere. And so you know what the latest one is? You've been watching the history of the, the Nature Channel? It came from aliens. <laughs> right? Isn't that the na- latest one? That's the scapegoat. No, you still still got a problem there. It says this, all things were made by him, he says there in the comic, and without him, nothing was made that was made. And the other guy said, gibberish, foolishness. And who, who's him? And they said, well, that would be God. And they laugh at him, snicker, ha, ha, ha. And he says, well, it's so funny. You've totally lost uh, 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 touch with reality. And they say, well, this guy's a nutcase. Okay, you tell me then, where did everything come from? It all made itself. Or it was all uh, here to begin with. Or UFOs trucked it in. Right? Isn't that the response today? A couple of things are going to deal with that real quick as we close. I want to hit this topic because it's, it's really, it really seems to be the third one. Because they're getting caught in these first two. They've been around for a while. But they're being exposed for how ridiculous they really are. So now everything's being blamed on the alien. Well, this is goofy. Even if aliens, in the true sense of what they want to have us believe they are, and I'll get to that in a second, existed... And it doesn't explain anything. All you did was take this problem with, okay, in the beginning, there was this tiny thing of dirt. And it blew up. The logical question to that is, where did the dirt came from? Who made the dirt? Right? So you didn't explain it. You got a problem. Well, if you're going to say, not in the beginning, the dirt, but in the beginning, alien, all you did was increase the size of that piece of dirt. (laughs) <laughs> you didn't solve the problem. Because then logically, keep going backwards because of the law of cause and effect. Well, then who caused that alien to come to being? Well, it was these other aliens over millions of years from a distant... Okay, that's nice. Well, who made those aliens? Well, it was other aliens from another planet. Okay, but who made those aliens? Well, it was these aliens over here. Oh, by the way, there's no proof of this and you're just making it up as you go, by the way. Uh, and then who made those aliens? You didn't... You didn't all there is, is is a detour to the ultimate thing back down to this. Who made the dirt? You're just calling it by a different name. Alien. Now we know, so you don't, you're still avoiding the question and you didn't answer the question. And just as we close, we talked about this on the final countdown today, but since we're in this context, I wanted to explain uh, what's really going on with that. Now I truly believe that when you're dealing with uh, uh, alien uh, technology, I think most of the technology that people see, say, are UFOs and whatever, I think a lot of it's military, governmental aircraft, whatever. But I do believe there's a small contingent of things that are not explained away is just technology. And now I am clearly convinced that you're dealing with a demonic deception. Okay? Number one, the whole belief in aliens as it's being perpetrated upon us is based on a lie called evolution. Because the premise to believe in aliens is you have to believe that they're a higher evolved race. Well, wait a second. If evolution is not true, then your whole premise of your existence is based on a lie. Red flag, red flag, something's lying to me. Okay, the second thing that we know that uh, they do is they come all the way, supposedly, across the universe. And rather than providing us something we would think would be useful, especially if they're so much more scientifically advanced and intelligent than we are, you think they'd give us a cure for cancer or something nifty like that. No, you come all the way across the universe to tell us that all of us are, this is the channeled messages from these supposed beings, 
that all of us are little gods. Why? That's impossible. That had a beginning, can't become God. So you lied right off the bat, but you came all the way across the universe to tell us that lie. As well as, the earth is a living entity and we need to worship her and change our ways or we'll be destroyed. That's pantheism, that's guy worship, that's a lie. You came all the way across the universe to keep telling us another lie. And then, they come all across the universe to say that Jesus, Muhammad, and Buddha all came from the extraterrestrials to assist mankind in our next step of evolution. They say there's no such... You came all the way across the universe just to declare this message. There is no such thing as sin and we don't need to be saved. Why do you always attack Christianity? You come all the way across the universe, you promote a one world religion, and everybody's right, nobody's wrong, and we've got to combine the one world religions, this is what they also say, We've got to come, uh, come under a one world ruler and a one world government. That's what they're telling people. Okay? And yet, you say that Jesus had it wrong. Christians are wrong. The Bible isn't true. You come all the way across the universe. Why are you just picking on Christians? And Christianity in the Bible. That's kind of fishy. Uh, they say, again, Orthodox Christianity has it wrong. Jesus' real message was to teach us that we can become Christ's. Okay? Uh, that mankind, again, needs to unite in a one-world government, a one-world religion, under a one-world ruler, or we will be destroyed. Listen, to aid in contacting them, we need to refrain from certain foods, practice meditation, and get ourselves worked up into an altered state of consciousness. Now, this always blew me away. Wait a second. You're supposed to be this highly advanced, super-duper race, much more intelligent and scientifically advanced than us, and you mean to tell me the only way that I can contact you is I have to use occult techniques and whip my body up into an altered state of consciousness so you can speak through me? What's that sound like? Oh, and by the way, you admit that your ultimate goal is to not just speak through me, you actually want to inhabit me? What? I'm thinking you could beat me down a walkie-talkie, you could at least tap into my cell phone, use our technology, I I mean... (laughs) Can, can, can I call you on the phone? Send me, how about an email? Why is the only way that I can contact you is through occult techniques? And by the way, you want to come inside me. You're dealing with a demonic thing. Uh, they, they act uh, spiritual. Uh, UFO uh, experts say, this is secular research, not so much material, because they clock them at speeds like 16,000 miles an hour making right turns. We know uh, in physics that if that were to happen, you'd be road pizza. Okay, you can't survive that. Okay, uh, but what they see is these things are more ethereal in nature. They literally say, listen, this is a quote, they are not coming, this is the experts, they're saying that you can no longer entertain this thought that these, quote, beings, whatever they are, they're not coming from outer space, they're coming from inner space, they're coming from another dimension. Hey, wait a second. The Bible talks about God living in this realm of eternity where there is no time. We're in this dimension of time that is created. And there's these certain critters called angels that are interdimensional beings that can pop in, pop out. Now, there's good angels and there's bad angels. And they pop in, they pop out. Well, that's very interesting. Okay? And, uh, but let me give you a couple more and then we'll close. Well, I think it's, we're clearly dealing with this. this. And this one to me is the biggest one. Why is it that if these critters do come your way, okay, and there's a genuine encounter with something, and this is secular research, that there's only one way to get rid of these beings, and it works 100% of the time, every single time. And that's this, when you command them in the name of Jesus Christ to leave, and they do. I interviewed a lady from Oregon, her name's Christine, that's all I'll tell you, and she told me that when that happened to her and her twin sister up in Oregon, and all they knew to do was call upon the name of Jesus Christ. She says, as soon as they said the name Jesus, there was three of these critters. She said, they ran, they ran so fast, they even tripped over each other. Not, not Buddha. Not Kentucky Fried Chicken. Why? Of all things, I can rebuke you 100% of the time and cause you to flee at the name of Jesus Christ. And lastly, one thing that they come all the way across the universe, supposedly, okay, to say this, to explain away the next prophetic event on God's time calendar, and it's called the rapture. Here's an actual quote. He says this, there will be great shiftings in humanity on this planet. This is what they're trying to tell these people and us. 
It will seem that great chaos and turmoil are forming, that nations are rising against each other in war, and that earthquakes are happening more frequently. (gasps) You must have some incredible knowledge. How could they know our future? Read the Bible. Did you know the devil knows the Bible? Hello? But see, it's not the seven-year tribulation. Here's what they say. Uh, Earth is shaking itself free. It's Mother Earth in pain and travail. (laughs) Okay? And a certain realignment or adjustment period is to be expected. Listen. The people who leave the planet during the time of earth changes do not fit here any longer and they are stopping the harmony of the earth, you nasty Christian. Quote, when the time comes that perhaps 20 million people leave the planet at one time, there will be a tremendous shift in consciousness for those who are remaining. You come all the way across the universe to tell us all kinds of lies, debunk Christianity, slam Jesus, slam the Bible... I can only communicate to you through cold techniques. I can command you in the name of Jesus Christ to flee, and you do 100% of the time. And you come all the way across the universe just to explain away the rapture of the church. Man, no wonder Jesus said, Matthew 24, the very first thing the apostles said, what what can we expect the last days? How do we know what's getting close? Watch out that no one deceives you. Deceit, deceit. Deceit. Satan has been working on this lie to explain away the rapture of the church. It's not... I mean, think about it. People disappear. It's going to happen. You can't spin that baby away. It's going to happen. It's going to be a global event. You better have some good excuse. This is a fantastic one. This one's one that's been working on for the last 150 years since the, the, the lie of evolution with Darwin. And it's now coming into fruition. Don't worry. I, yeah, your loved ones disappear. You know that the government's been hiding it from you. You caught us. But we can't, uh, we got to tell you, it's, it's true. UFOs, aliens are real. And uh, they beamed them up to their spaceships. And, uh, but don't feel bad because they aren't ready to go into the time of the earth changes, the age of utopia. But you, you have been left behind. You're the chosen ones. And now, mankind can finally have peace. They will actually take the event that takes the beginning of the rapture of the church, the beginning of the seven-year tribulation, which Jesus says is the worst time in the history of mankind. They will actually get people to think it's a badge of honor who are left behind. Isn't that sick? And that's exactly what our planet is heading for. So aliens not only are a lie, but aliens, even though they were trying to do this excuse, still logically, even if you didn't want to look at their identity, still do not disprove and do the existence of God and they don't answer the question. All it is is a different piece of dirt. Where'd the dirt come from? Where'd the alien come from? Sorry, it doesn't solve the question. Lord willing, next time we're going to get into uh, the issue of intelligent design. If you see design in something, it implies a designer. And folks, I'm telling you, once we, Lord willing, finish that chapter, uh, then that's when we're going to take our first big giant detour and go through at least 10 weeks. Lord willing, 10 weeks. I'm going to take you on a journey all the way from the telescope all the way down to the microscope looking at all the amazing design that we see in all of life which tells us it had to come from God. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Well, hi, this is Pastor Billy Crone of Sunrise Baptist Church and I hope you enjoyed today's study. But before you go, let me ask you one final question. Are you sure that if you were to die today that you go to heaven and not hell? Before you answer that, Let me share a couple things with you. Did you know that the Bible says that God is holy and that we are not? And the Bible also says that the wages of our sin or our unholiness is death. In other words, when we die, and it's coming for each one of us, we're all marching towards the grave at different speeds, but it's going to happen. The Bible says, therefore, since the wages of our sin is death, we deserve to die and go straight to hell and not to heaven. And that's bad enough, but to make matters worse, we don't want to admit this. God already knows. He knows uh, all of our behavior, everything, our thoughts, what we've done, what even we're going to do. He knows it all. He's gone. Even though he already knows this, we don't want to admit this. And so out of love and mercy, God gave us something called his law or the Ten Commandments. It's kind of like his x-ray into our heart to show us what he already knows, that he is holy and that we are not. And it's this unholiness or sin that separates us from him. Let's take a look at God's x-ray, if you will, his divine law, to show us what he already knows. 
the Ten Commandments, uh, the ninth one says this, you shall not bear false witness. Okay? That's called lying. Okay? And if you've ever told a lie once, which we all have, myself included, the Bible says that makes you a liar. Okay? The, the, another commandment says, you shall not steal. Okay? Uh, and you might think, well, that's something that everybody does. Well, it doesn't make it right. And it demonstrates what God is trying to show us, that uh, we all have sin, and it's separating us from him. Even if you took a pencil in the third grade from somebody, if you did it without permission, that's stealing. And so now you've become a thief. The Bible says that you shall not use the Lord's name in vain. And how interesting it is and unfortunate that the only name under heaven by which men might be saved, the name Jesus Christ, has now become a common cuss word. The Bible says that God is so holy that even his name is holy. If you've taken the Lord's name in vain and used it as a cuss word or even flippantly, the Bible calls that the sin of blasphemy. And so now you become a blasphemer. The Bible says you shall not commit adultery. And Jesus says if you even look at another person with lust in your eye, you've committed adultery in your heart. And finally, the Bible says uh, you shall not murder. And you might think, well, hey, I haven't done that one. Really? Well, again, the Bible says that the sin of hatred is the same as the sin of murder. The only difference is you pulled the trigger, if you will, in your heart. You wish they were dead. And in God's eyes, it's the same thing in principle. Folks, that's only just a couple of the Ten Commandments. We didn't even go through all of them. But I think you're starting to get the picture. The Bible is correct. We have all fallen short of the glory of God, myself included. And that we are separated from God as a result. And so when our time comes, we're not automatically going to heaven. We are headed for judgment. We are headed for hell. Now let me tell you the good news. The good news is that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to save us. Jesus Christ died on the cross. It was the death penalty of its day. He paid in full uh, the price for our sins to be forgiven. Let me give you an analogy. E- for instance, even today, we could see that a person could commit a crime. Uh, they, they cannot reverse it. The, the sentence has been passed. The judge has uh, slammed his gavel and they are ushered off into their jail cell. And in this particular crime, they are going to receive the death penalty. And so they're behind bars just waiting for the time, waiting for the call for them to go and uh, receive the death penalty. But believe it or not, as we know, there is a way that a person can get off a death row. And that is if the one in authority, the governor, would grant them a pardon. Now, they didn't earn it. Uh, They certainly don't deserve it. And there's nothing they could do uh, to earn it because nothing can reverse their crime. Okay? Yet the one in authority has that ability to grant them a pardon. Well, can I tell you something? That's what God has done through Jesus Christ. The cross was the death penalty of the day. God sent his one and only son to die on the cross, to take the death penalty in our place, and that if we would just receive his pardon for all of our sins, God is willing to allow us to get off a death row. He's willing to forgive us completely of all of our sins. That's the good news that I want to share with you. God loves you. The Bible says that God is not willing that anyone should perish, but everyone come to repentance. Won't you, if that's you, call upon the name of Jesus Christ right now? Won't you ask him to forgive you for sins? The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Won't you do that now, wherever you are? Please, take God up on his amazing, loving offer. I'll let you down. Man will let you down. People will let you down. But God never will. He wants to adopt you into his forever family. He loves you. He's willing to forgive you of anything and everything you've ever done, past, present, and future. It's amazing. Please, call upon Jesus now. Well, this has been Pastor Billy Crone of Sunrise Baptist Church. If there's anything that we can do for you, please don't hesitate to ask. Our number and information will come up here on the screen here shortly. And remember... I hope to see you in heaven. God bless. Thank you for watching this presentation from Sunrise Baptist Church. 
If you would like to send us a letter or any other kind of postage, you can reach us at 1780 Betty Lane, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89156. For more information, you can give us a call at 702-452-8599 or email us at bcrone at getalifemedia.com or you can visit our website at www.getalifemedia.com. Billy Crone and this ministry can also be found on Facebook and Twitter. Join us for services at www.sunriselv.com.